Okay. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed lunch uh, as much as uh, you enjoyed the presentations. We are going to start uh, with uh, a bit of intra-panel discussion. Uh, it's uh, voluntary, of course, if you have any comments on uh, either of the other uh, presentations, anything that caught your mind and uh, that you'd like to challenge, that's the best, if we can have some difference of opinion about European security. And uh, Walter, let, let's go in the same, uh, same order as we, we started. So Walter, was there anything particular here for your liking or dismay? Well, I hate to be such a... Uh, <laughs> you know, sort of tame and boring person, but I really enjoyed all the other <laughs> speakers and thought everybody had some very interesting things to say. Uh, since you're pressing us to be disagreeable, and uh, uh, I don't know, is that the Norwegian national character, or, or are we just lucky to have you? Um, He's my former student. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, you know, the only real experience of Norwegian culture I've had lately is watching Lillehammer on Netflix. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> it's a great show. It is. It's actually <laughs> quite nice. Um, but I did, one thing that did strike me, Turkey came up a couple of times in the conversation. I was just at Halifax where the Turks made quite, a, quite an impression on people. And I do wonder if Europe, when it's thinking about security issues, doesn't need to think about how does the European security situation change if there's an actively hostile Turkey. That is to say a Turkey that might be working, and I've heard some Germans talk about their concerns here, in parallel with Russia in the Balkans against EU and NATO expectations, and maybe in other places. Um, certainly in military terms, Turkey is a massive element in NATO, and if we take that out of the, just hypothetically, out of the positive column mm. for European security and put it not in a neutral, but in a negative column, uh, do we, what kind of rethink do we need? Hmm. John, did you have a comment there? Yes, I'm writing uh, on a book which is due to the publisher on January 1st, mm. so this is on my mind. And one chapter is on migration and how Europe handles migration. Uh, and clearly one has finally come to the conclusion that one must have border control and perhaps closing of borders in order to stop migrants. But that is too harsh to say up front. So one outsources it to Turkey and Libya, uh, to whomever can uh, carry arms, I guess, in Libya. This is a very poor solution uh, as such because it brings this vulnerability uh, this dependency uh, on the part of EU, um, EU, Germany in particular, I think in, in this case with the Turkey deal. Uh, and this is, uh, it, it's almost uh, uh, sort of impossible to understand how, for instance, Germany and Turkey interact at the moment. They are partners in migration policy control yet they are enemies in <laughs> adversaries, should one say, in terms of the values, or, uh, as we all are in terms of liberal democratic values and human rights. And also Norway has given uh, political asylum to, to five uh, officers uh, last year or this year, in fact. And of course, you can't square the circle there. You can't say to Turkey, we are partners, uh, uh, but, uh, so, so this doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's impossible, for a diplomat, this would be uh, impossible to create what they call constructive ambiguity about the situation. Mm. Uh, so it is a conflictual relationship mm. today, and nobody seems to pay much attention to it. Mm. Is it because one cannot square that circle and find, can't sort of say two and two make five, <coughs> or in this case, maybe three? Hmm. Also in the presentations, Janne, is there any particular thing you'd like to raise? We can go. Yeah, it sounds like a school examination. Yeah. Which <laughs> grade should we give the others? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done many of so those. oral examination. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, uh, this is uh, 
uh, these are very interesting uh, analyses, and uh, they all point in, in the same direction. There is something pr very problematic about our, the state of our democracies, the relationship with so-called elites, I don't mm. like that word, but um, voters mm. and what voters want. Mm. Uh, and I think much of this must have to do with um, uh, sort of the globalization idea that uh, uh, there is no there's only one model for the whole world after 1990s hubris mm. uh, that led politicians to sort of assume a global responsibility for getting about uh, their own voters mm. and uh, forgetting about the social contract, which is mm. pretty hard on uh, participants sometimes, paying 50% taxes as we <laughs> do here and mm. doing conscription and so on. Mm. So there's something that is common to all Western countries now uh, sort of protest uh, of some kind, if we call it that. I would not call it populism, because this is a derogatory mm. term. Yep. And that has to do with security defense policy when we are not just doing the force for good humanitarian intervention, mm. but that is a sort of a, a past thing. Now we are doing serious state-to-state -state, uh, security policy again. Mm. I'm sure I can't make you disagree with uh Walters, no borders, no states. Uh, oh, I mean, it's a logical connection. Mm. You don't have a state if you don't have borders. Mm. Uh, and if you can't control the borders, you have a failed state, mm. presumably. Care anything, uh, any issues you'd like to raise from the other presentations? Well, when it comes to these things, it's hard to get out of the habit of presenting with a Moscow hat on, uh, because I'm usually <laughs> asked to say, how does it look, look to the other side? And with that view of all of the other presentations, I, uh, as the Kremlin representative, I'm feeling quite reassured because not only is there this huge disparity between the approaches to defense and security between the Northern European actors that we've heard, uh, none of which are actually facing up directly to the challenge. Also, we haven't even heard from the whole swathe of Southern European contributors to NATO who would also be have, to have to be convinced that the challenge was there. So in that respect, I've heard uh, nothing which makes me any less confident that, uh, that Russia still in enjoys quite a wide range of potential levers to mitigate what it sees as its security challenges and therefore cause serious problems for any of us. Hmm. Andrew, any uh, Yes, thank you. And again, uh, I greatly enjoyed the panel, and thank you to the organizers for bringing me here. I, I, I want to say something that I've been worried about, and I think it concerns a point Walter made. Uh, that is that alliances are not things that are. Alliances are things that are being constantly made. They have to be mm -hmm. uh, reinvested in, if you will. Yeah. And I think what we're talking about is uh, and that term sometimes almost disappears from our discourse, is the collective West, right? Uh, uh, I've been of the opinion that even though we now see you know, Russian spies under every broadcast, and, and I'm not questioning that the Russians have not been proactively engaged, but I've always been of the opinion that if we get our own issues right internally, then the Russian problem will be much smaller than we make it out to be today. Mm. So that's the first point. The second point, um, I've been observing how a lot of European policy elites have responded to the Trump administration. And, and I like the red state, blue state, American analogy because I think it tells you a lot about where we are as a country. But I think it's also fair to say that the European policy elites feel more comfortable with the blue America, with the bicoastal kind of uh, mindset. Um, so that I so often run into people who tell me they've been to the U.S. because they went to New York, Washington, and San Francisco, and then they're pontificating, <laughs> trying to let me know, you know, what my country is about. Th there's a larger point here, um, and it's recognized by some of the most enlightened European politicians. Ambassador Ischinger, who runs uh, the Munich Security Conference, wrote a piece, I think, for Der Spiegel, mm -hmm when he said, when it came to the Trump administration, engage, engage, engage. And I was in Munich with a colleague who is a Democrat, declared Democrat, uh, supporting Hillary Clinton. And his message again to people in the audience was reach out to the United States, you know, especially to this presidency. Make sure that, that you deliver some clear, transparent, visible victories, if you will. 
I'm trying to make a larger point. I mean, we keep counting bullets and guns and how many brigades. The real strength of the alliance has always been the sense of kind of obvious reciprocity. I don't have a better way of saying it. And I think the Brits are still riding that wave, thinking of themselves as being in this very direct way connected to the United States. So my plea here to my Norwegian friends and hosts and anybody who's listening is engage. You know, the, the kind of caricatures about our country that are being produced on a daily basis. And I'm not saying that we don't provide a lot of <laughs> material for humor. We do. That's how we roll. That's what we do. Uh, but I think Walter is absolutely right. The people who will show up and the Americans show up are more likely to come from the red America than from the blue America and to understand how that mindset really operates and what is important to us is absolutely critical. And we've lost one, one last comment. During the Cold War, we had daily interaction between the officers from the US side and various European officers. You know, basically, we knew each other. Softball games, barbecues, families, outings. This. Remember, there's our footprint has been shrunk to what it is today. That element is also less and less visible. And quite frankly, in the United States, the majority of the people have absolutely no clue mm -hmm. what this organization is all about when we speak about NATO. Yeah. What it does is the new you know, name for a new, I don't know, milkshake or something. They really don't know. <laughs> One of the best things we, we did not so, not so long ago was to actually bring the show back home, take it to Chicago, show people what this is about. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Any comments to Kira or uh, Andrews? openings, Jana, and then yeah, I Robert. I think this is, uh, it's important, that's another lesson of just basic politics and international politics is that presidents or prime minister governments, they come and go. Uh, and it's not person dependent because it is, uh, international politics is really about interests and interests are then grounded often, <coughs> not always, but often in common norms and values. So this is, uh, the, the, in a way, the, the disliking of Bush, uh, for instance, in the Bush period was also intense and it was very much of the same kind of Euro European uh, reactions. Uh, and uh, <coughs> in a way, th this sh shouldn't be important. It's mm. not really important. And I think you said that, Rob, yeah. that uh, watch uh, not your lips, <laughs> watch your actions, <laughs> watch wha what is done. Is there continuity in the defense relationships? Yes, there is. I haven't mm. seen anything to the contrary. Mm. Um, we should then conclude that yes, there is continuity. Mm. Uh, and uh, this, is th this is true for, the, for all these uh, uh, sort of NATO-based relationship. Mm. And we should also I think uh, see that it's not Trump that has brought in more bilateral diplomacy and uh, national interest-based diplomacy because that has been that is the <laughs> the motor in a way of diplomacy anyway. NATO of 29, it's a whole yeah. whole whole lot of countries of which many are really big free riders, uh, and they get Article 5, uh, so they are members, but only some few states are able and willing to act militarily. Mm. You can count them on one hand plus maybe one or two. Mm. So this is, and this is how it has been, this is how it is now, and uh, that is why there will be groups of states uh, that share interests and that are willing to, um, to, to uh, contribute actively. Mm. Robert, do you, you were mentioned and you did talk about not basing intentions and strategic outlook on rhetoric? Well, one of the great things about being a pessimist is you're never disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you know, we're all pretty per pessimistic uh, in, in many ways, apart from Keir, by the sound of it. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think I, I echo uh, Optimist Professor Matlari's point that um, the uh, <coughs> you, we've been here before. In the 1980s, um, there were huge um, protests about the deployment of tactical cruise missiles in Europe, particularly in Britain. Uh, and there was a very um, powerful, vocal, left-wing lobby in the United Kingdom uh, that opposed nuclear weapons, that uh, opposed cruise deployments, that had a very strong anti-American sentiment. Um, the majority, <coughs> of course, the country was so closely akin culturally and I think you know, politically to the United States, in some cases, in my case, you know, familial 
uh, connection as well, that um, it, it was actually easy to overcome some of that rhetoric and actually say that really the established and enduring aspect of, of one strategy is about you know, how you behave. And, and it was seen to be self-evident to the British that that was the relationship. Um, I think you know, one of the things that, that is different this time around um, is that uh, it's been mentioned already about how Eastern Europe is now part of the European family in a way that it wasn't, of course, in the 1980s. Um, and countries like Greece, which um, had a very uh, strong revolutionary left-wing kind of politics, um, I mean, today, they look back at the last 20, 30 years and feel in Greece that signing up to the European Union was a great uh, move, it was a great decision, um, but they are seething. I, I was in Athens earlier this summer, and there is palpable daily anger about the European Union. Um, this sense of humiliation about it. And one is in Turkey, uh, again, much the same sort of sentiment. One of, um, we thought we were moving closer to Europe. Now we regard ourselves as the preeminent Middle Eastern power, not as a European country. And it's not surprising that under these conditions, of these crises we've been through over the last 20 years, that there would be a distancing uh, of relationships um, w within the European uh, and Western family, should we say, perhaps overall. But I suppose I, I was asked to think about a question, and, and my question is really about, uh, uncharacteristically, I'm going to be um, optimistic uh, <laughs> for a moment, and say that uh, we, I wonder if we're in danger, though, of talking ourselves into um, defeatism, uh, depression, uh, and you know, a, a setback here. That Europe is an incredibly wealthy region of the world. The United States is the most wealth wealthy and powerful um, country on earth. <coughs> and Europe is incredibly closely aligned to the United States. So that we, we should first of all look at the, the strength of that relationship. And I think you're right to so you're right, Andrew. So you go beyond the military equipment. Start thinking about what the na nature of this relationship is about. That'd be number one. Secondly, let's look at um, Russia's problems. I mean, you know, I look at Russian vulnerabilities and think that in the East Asian context, um, we've got problems, I think, Kira, I'm right in saying, depopulation, uh, economic depression. Um, I mean, a lot of Russians are pretty melancholic people anyway, but <laughs> it seems to me that in east, eastern you know, parts of the country, it's even more uh, perhaps the case there. Um, that They're very worried, traditionally, Russia, about its southern flank. And in the days of the Soviet Union, it could guarantee control of the southern frontier region because it controlled Kazakhstan as a Soviet republic and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. They're all part of the Soviet community, but now that's not true. Um, and there are frequent references, it seems to me, in Russia, and correct me if I'm wrong about it, but there are frequent references to, you know, Kazakhs uh, and to Uzbeks uh, and Turkmen particularly, not really aligning themselves to Russia, looking towards China as the future rather than Russia. And what about um, this whole business of hybrid warfare and information warfare? It seems to me it's been, it's run its course, actually. The Europeans and the Americans are incredibly alert now to, to what's going on. Um, and if the ant antidote to hybrid war is presumably imposing so much friction or damaging consequence that you stop doing what you're, do you're doing, or you face the consequences. I in other words, it's no longer a useful strategy to, to adopt a hybrid warfare strategy if it doesn't work anymore or if it becomes too dangerous and risky. Mm -hmm. I think we're possibly in that envelope already, and I'd be interested to know from UK whether you feel that actually Russian vulnerabilities are sort of overlooked um, at the moment in, in the West, and that really there are some fundamental problems with Russia that we probably ought to just examine honestly, as honestly as we examine all the other things that, that we've been talking about. Quick response before we go to Claudia. Yeah, absolutely. Fundamental problems which will make Russia a very, very different place in not very long from now. 20, 30, certainly 40 years, all of the process that you've <coughs> described, plus the immense impact of their their demographic black hole at the, uh, the beginning of the 1990s is going to make it a totally different space, politically and economically and probably geographically as well. And yes, the, you mentioned the Far East. Uh, in the whole of the Far Eastern Federal District of Russia, there are fewer people living there than there are in Moscow. Right. So you have a resource-rich population vacuum right next door to a resource-hungry population generator. That's not really a sustainable situation. But all of these problems and the basic challenge of the economy not being fit for purpose are things which Russia can survive for very much longer than a Western liberal democracy would be able to do. So they are, it's a long-term issue. 
the problem comes, and the problem is going to be reverting to the situation in the early 1990s when the biggest challenge perceived as coming from Russia was instability and uh, spillover effects on neighbors and where would all those nuclear weapons end up. The problem will come because Russia's leadership is historically extremely bad at telling when the tipping point is, mm -hmm. when exactly things are going to start going down the tubes. Mm -hmm. So two and a half, possibly three times during the 20th century, they spent themselves into state collapse by boosting their, their military capacity while ignoring the, the needs of the population. Putin has said repeatedly, we mustn't mis repeat that mistake again, but they're showing all signs of... Uh, preparing for that possible mistake in the wrong way. In other words, not easing the transition, not making it easier for people to accept the leadership, but arming a civil defense and civil order force with machine guns and mortars in order to suppress protest when it happens. <coughs> Very interesting. Claudia, I, any I, I have a, I have yep. a question. Yep. I know it's not my job to <laughs> have a question, <laughs> it's your job. Yeah, but uh, no. one, one uh, thinks about this realpolitik, realism, uh, non-democratic uh, great powers, China, Russia, then uh, Europe and this uh, uh, history of European expansion for democracy or sort of making the world safe or unsafe for democracy. Uh, is it time to say with Henry Kissinger that uh, sort of uh, we must deal with realpolitik as it is, uh, we mustn't continue this kind of uh, missionary effort on behalf, behalf of human rights, which are really a Western construct in terms of including liberal democracy uh, mechanism uh, of division of powers and free elections and so on. We must stop that now and let's just say, let's cooperate based on common interests. Uh, so that is of course something one maybe doesn't have a choice in doing or not, it's a reality, one has to do that. Uh, but it strikes me that that kind of cooperation yeah. cannot be very deep because the trust isn't, the trust between partners seems to be wedded very much to mm. common standards and norms and even values. Mm. It's a question for you. I'm handing that one to Kier very oh, quickly sure. and then yeah. we need Claudia and Etienne. Uh, well. You say we don't have a choice, but of course there's a choice. There's a values choice. The, the Kissingers and the Mearsheimers uh, have a strong argument to say NATO enlargement was a mistake because it impinges on, on Russia's perceived security needs. And therefore, they suggest, well, actually, we should just hand it back. That is the choice. Uh, have Yalta. a peaceful new life Yalta. with, yes, with a new Yalta. We, we, uh, we keep Russia temporarily happily happy by abandoning all of the fundamental values and principles that Western democracies and, and NATO and the EU are based on. But if on. we say NATO border is the border, and we don't, I mean, Ukraine, we, do, we don't really care to uh, try to reform Ukraine. That Why should we? It's a little bit late for that, unfortunately. And of course, this, this would not satisfy Kissinger and Mearsheimer, let alone Putin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Claudia, uh, any... What's your take on this? Um, actually, I wanted to make two, two quick comments. The first one was on that word action uh, thing we discussed here and in the, in the previous session. So to what extent we, don't, we shouldn't listen to what is said, but rather look what's happening on the ground, uh, particularly uh, when we talk about uh, Trump and, and, the, and the US administration, where the words are, I tend to see, say, catastrophe, but the actions are still there. But I still would, would say that action needs to be framed somehow by words. And if actions are not framed by words, by words, they lose in value. So it's nice to say to most of the Europeans or many American friends, tell me just kind of look what's happening and don't listen. I think it's an easy way out. Mm. And if the words don't match the actions, we have a major problem. And one of the, of the consequences is a problem um, of, of reliability. But the main point I wanted to make, I think one of the, the elements that came true in all comments, but we didn't really, really say it precisely, is sovereignty. And sovereignty, I tend to think, is one of the key elements uh, we need to talk about in European defence. Sovereignty, in a very simplistic definition, means to have the means to decide and then to implement my decision. And if you look at Europeans in the area of security and defence, we are all able to decide but nobody's actually really able to implement it on its own. 
So again, to put it in a rather simplistic question, who is able to take on Russia or the IS on its own? Nobody. In operations, Europeans understand that. And they used to cooperate from Bosnia up to Libya to, to the EFP. But in practice, we all clinch to our illusion of sovereignty. We all pretend to have a national army which we're able to decide and to send somewhere, which is rubbish. We don't mm. have it. Mm. So the question is, when will we as Europeans consciously accept that the sovereignty we share with so much doesn't exist anymore? Mm. First question. And the second question is, what is the framework in which we are going to manage that sovereignty? So consciously abandon sovereignty and manage it in a greater framework. Mm. Is this the European Union? Because there we can also include industrial elements. Or what is it? The question is, the longer we wait and the longer we pretend there's no sovereignty issue, the less capabilities and the less political influence we have. So I think the white elephant in the room in European defence cooperation is in the end sovereignty. And I mean, you mentioned that with, with, with Britain. I think all states somehow have the illusions that they still have sovereignty and they, they think sovereignty is more actually important than capacity to act because you could gain capacity to act if you would share sovereignty. Hmm. I think your serve landed in uh, Robert's court. <laughs> and uh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to, to rephrase a small question there as well. Uh, when Donald Trump uh, uh, is flippant about Article 5 commitments, uh, surely you must think that that is rhetoric that matters. Uh, and not only uh, judging by actions. It has to do with commitment and speech acts and so on, I suppose. Mm. Oh, well, let me first of all clarify what I meant by words and actions. I mean, um, the actions I'm talking about are over a very long period of time, and they're an enduring set of uh, actions and behaviours which determine what a national strategy or policy really is, as opposed to what you might see periodically appear in a, a defence review. Um, it's more the Trump, the Trump uh, words. But, but yes, ab absolutely. And, and it's, you're right to say, of course, that um, you know, actions without any sort of um, rhetorical justification or explanation would clearly be um, absurd and actually easy to exploit. I mean, one can easily exploit those sort of situations. Equally, any statements, political statements, uh, that are not backed up or cannot be backed up appear to be equally... Uh, fallacious and, and the most uh, pressing example, um, you know, and this isn't my view, I'm merely reporting what is said, but critics would argue the European Union that insisting on the rhetoric of ever closer political union has been the very cause of the problems that it's faced over this issue of sovereignty. I mean, if, for example, we said to the United States, now, in order to fulfill European defence, you, the Americans, have to give up a portion of your sovereignty. Well, Britain tried that in the 1770s, and look where that got us. Um, <laughs> you know, if we said to the Canadians, you know, we expect you to understand that on your own you can't defend yourself, so you must give up your framework of sovereignty or a portion of it in order to recognise that only as a collective organisation can we fight. Well, that, that would equally be um, unsustainable. I think, you know, the great advantage of the NATO alliance is has been a recognition of individual national sovereignty while still saying in a practical terms, regardless of the words, practical terms, we must interoperate together, we must synchronise our actions, and there will be some collective decisions on which our national defence depends. And one of those, the most important, is Article 5. And the most important element of Article 5 is nuclear deterrence. Um, now, some European countries don't have an independent nuclear deterrent. Some do. Um, and it's the European countries um, that are smaller ones that depend on the willingness of the United States, Britain and France to make use of that nuclear weapon system, even though it would cost them everything to do so. Andrew, you had a quick comment and then Just Etienne. Two, two very quick comments. And, and, and again, collective defense is not about verbal signaling of virtue. It's about what we do. And if you travel to Warsaw or Vilnius or Riga or Tallinn today, and you realize that they actually have American, British, and other NATO assets on their territory. That is a sea change of where NATO was only, say, a decade ago, while all the rhetoric about collective defense and commitment and out of area and all this other alphabet soup was in place. And just to quote a diplomat, <clears throat> it was relayed to me when, when our brigade combat team came into, into Poland, it was, welcome, you're 70 years late. Uh, the argument being that all of a sudden those countries are now, for the first time since enlargement, 
enjoying full Sorry. commitment, if you will, in, at least in terms of this tripwire deterrence that we have. That is a sea change. Point number two, we arguably have the most transatlanticist and probably one of the most competent national security teams we've had in years. I mean, you're talking at a very senior level, very experienced strategic, strategic thinkers. So I would side with Robert saying, uh, if, you wanna, if you want to really look at where the alliance is, at least get the full line of what was being said. Case in point, when I think it was still candidate Trump who said NATO is obsolete. Mm -hmm. And he had the second part of that phrase, and it needs to be reformed. But the headline would only run NATO is obsolete. Mm -hmm. And then he would come in and say, well, NATO has a role in, in CT, and NATO has a role in, in, in territorial defense. And all of a sudden, we had the most unexpected kind of framing of a potential consensus on, uh, on a shared threat. And the last comment on sovereignty, migration is not a force of nature. It's not a tsunami uh, that, that kind of occurs. The fact that states have borders and decide that those borders will or will not be permeable, that's a political decision. Yeah. Um, this is a debate we have in the United States since the 1965 immigration reform, actually, of, of how we're going to do immigration. Uh, this is not to you know, disavow the fact that you've got about 25 million people on the move now and that you've got people clustering around the Med trying to enter Europe. But it doesn't absolve the political leadership in Europe of crafting a policy that addresses that in a way that's somehow conducive to the democratic processes in the country, the more so if you're in Schengen. If you're in a Schengen area, a unilateral state decision on immigration, whether to close it or to open the border, what the Hungarians did, what the Germans did, these are decisions that are gonna impact the entire European Union. And finally, I would really, we just had PESCO sign, I think about what, a week ago or so, um, 23 countries. What, what really kind of concerns me is that we're once again, when, when I look at my European friends, are racing in the direction of building these institutional frameworks, uh, how we will finally get the resources in place and denationalize the whole process. Well, newsflash, if you talk to people who actually work in the defense sector, national priorities rule. We can talk all we want about how this all should be internationalized, pulled and everything else, when you get to the nuts and bolts of how you will spend your own money, that's where you end up. You end up with national priorities and you will never end up with a system of systems, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you look at how wealthy Europe is, and I think this is absolutely correct, Europe has never been as affluent as it is today. What I also find striking, and this is to some extent true probably about my own country, is the inability of the leadership to deliver large policy solutions. And instead, we hear little changes and adaptations being touted as great adjustments, you know, achievement and whatnot. Europe doesn't have a resource problem. I mean, Europe has the resources to do so. But what it requires is a, is a decision that those resources will be committed. Because if the rhetoric is what it is, and we believe it is, right, that, that the threats are multiplying, it's the Russians are under every bed, and, and they're coming, you know, full bore into the Baltics and whatnot then act on it. I mean, if the situation is as dire, don't come back and say, and then I will increase my defense spending by 0 .000 .001 over the next 20 years, because to Red America, this is absurd. This is silly. As they say in Tennessee, that dog won't hunt. This is just not going to happen. Yeah. Great. Uh, Etienne yeah. and then Janne, Walter, and Claudia. Can I, can I just have a quick two fingers on that one? Very quick. Um, I think the the fact that we discuss what Trump said or didn't say, and whether it was before he was sworn in or after, show that words matter. If you remember the May summit, which wasn't a summit but just a NATO meeting, um, his, discor his discourse was rather watched in the European capitals. So I think saying that whatever he says doesn't matter, it, it doesn't work. It's That's not, not only I'm it's saying. not I'm it's not it matters, only about but listen to everything that he says and look at the actions that follow. Yeah, but not disavowing that it's not matter. only about capabilities. It needs to be somehow framed. That's the first. And, and the second, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but if every state buys two aircrafts, it doesn't make much sense. If one state, or if they would put that together, and one state had it, and they had one maintenance chain, they would get out much more of it. So at some point, states need to cooperate better. 
French but this, No, I, I got to address this. This is not just about <laughs> acquisition. If you, have, if you have a couple of planes that all they can do is fly in circles over your capital, this is not a deployable air force. This is a flight club. It doesn't matter what you actually buy, the largest structure which you're trying to do, how you're going to deploy, that means a NATO context to me. If the, if the alliance remains the linchpin of European security, as I believe, and, and I think I believe there, there's reciprocity here, then it, it is not just a question of whether or not you create better efficiencies in how you buy hardware, but it's actually how your planning evolves mm -hmm. for starters before you start plugging the kit into it. I agree, but that's sovereignty. Mm. It doesn't mean everybody on its own. It means coordination, synchronization, and to some extent it means that states give up sovereignty on a certain level and put it on another one. And the question is the framework. Why and I do think states have to give up, give up sovereignty? Up sovereignty. Mm. Why should they give up sovereignty? The end, they have done it already. Uh, well, not in defense. The patient French. Not in defense. The, the, the patient end. French. <laughs> that's, uh, oh, wow. that's not, but now the debate's can, good. There's a difference of opinion. I don't Please. know if I can reconcile everyone. I don't <laughs> think so. Uh, Try. <laughs> um, from a French point of view, certainly, uh, uh, we are not capable of doing everything. I've said it that much, but we ensure our own deterrent because we drew the opposite lesson from the Brits out of the Suez episode in 56 that never again we would depend as much as we had in the past on the US, ex especially for existential <laughs> threats. So we can answer all right, uh, at, at least at the national level, at that very existential uh, level. We can also, uh, on a national basis, decide, and not just decide, but actually carry out interventions such as Mali. Hmm. We can do that. We have the decision-making process that allows for it. We have the capabilities that allows for it. Now. That's one thing, to, to be there for the long haul, to be in the cell for years on end. Yes, we, we are very appreciative of all the help we get from our US, German, Norwegian, etc. friends. And we do get some help, and it's very important that we do. Uh, <clears throat> but there are things that can be done on the national level uh, and that don't need to be shared. And there are things that cannot really be shared, especially in the nuclear realm, obviously. Uh, uh, but I, I think quite clearly, uh, given the, uh, again, the intensity of the threats and risks we face today and the fact that they are all coming at us at the same time, cooperation makes a great deal of sense. So whether or not uh, it's a loss of sovereignty, I, I'm not going to debate, frankly speaking, because it really depends on how you define sovereignty, I think. Uh, uh, but what really matters is, is that something at the end works. Uh, uh, and, and delivers, and yes, it has to be operational, I think mm. our own forces are. Uh, now I want to get back to a second thing that was uh, said about NATO, and uh, I'm not going to discuss the history of NATO, it's not, <laughs> uh, it's not for me to do that, and, and the history of enlargement. However, I want to point out that blurring the difference between the countries or the borders of NATO as it exists today and the countries that are not NATO members is in no one's interest. It weakens deterrence, to be quite clear. Hmm? Uh, so, obviously, uh, NATO is an alliance of uh, free sovereign states, uh, and NATO, on principle, cannot be close to anyone, that's for sure, and NATO countries always uh, uh, restate those principles. However, from a strategic angle, we have to be uh, uh, um, fully um, aware of what I just said, which is that blurring the lines or the boundaries between NATO space and non-NATO space is very dangerous, including for the new NATO member states, to mm -hmm. be quite clear. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> linked to that, I wanted also to react about the uh, tripwire deterrence. It's a long-standing French-American debate. We don't <laughs> think about deterrence exactly the same way. In our view, uh, it makes a whole lot of sense not to mass too many military capabilities very close to the to Russia's borders, for instance. First, because we don't want that to be too provocative and, and feed the narrative that NATO is somehow threatening Russia, which is not. Uh, second, because those capabilities might be needed, needed elsewhere, and as uh, Keir reminded all of us, including from Russia, it's not just about this or that spot, so we don't know, and we have to retain a 360 degree posture because we don't know what the next contingency will be. But at a more fundamental level, uh, if you start piling up stuff, you also give the impression that you're ready to have a fine battle somewhere in the Baltics or somewhere in Northern Europe, provided that the rest of the West is spared. 
That was our concern during the Cold War. We didn't want to have a limited nuclear war, which would have been limited to Europe, but of course uh, would have spared uh, core Russian and American territory. So for us, it has, the, the, the whole tripwire is, re is really the heart of the deterrence logic. Uh, uh, the, point of, of the, the point is quite clear. Uh, the, uh, the weight of escalation has to rest on whatever external threat uh, might want to do something. Uh, and they might, and they will, in our view, reconsider uh, before doing anything very dangerous because, you know, even if it's a small number, killing a small number of U.S., French, British, and German troops, you know how you start. You, you don't know how you finish this. Mm. And that's the heart of deterrence. Whereas, again, trying to have, uh, to give the impression that you're ready to wage uh, some sort of localized battle uh, mm. could be actually uh, detrimental to deterrence. Mm. A final point I wanted to make, which brings us uh, completely out of Europe, <laughs> uh, but actually European interests are at stake, certainly French interests are, and I wanted to respond to what you said. Uh, we shouldn't just be entirely focused on our security problems. They are very substantial indeed. Uh, however, uh, the situation in Asia is uh, very problematic. We are aware of that. France as a country has overseas territories in that region. We have. Uh, I, I briefly alluded to it. We have different uh, cooperation agreements with several countries in the region, Australia and India, and we have to be aware that it's uh, that you know it's the the, the fast arming region in the world, the, the region where uh, uh, many nuclear powers now uh, interact. Mm -hmm. So it's a very dangerous region, and we should not just focus on what's happening here. And if an alliance, uh, if a, the word alliance is to mean something. Obviously, we will have to take that into account because it's a huge deal for the U.S. But it's, it's, it should also be a huge deal to us because our interests, commerce, etc., are, are also at stake in Asia. Mm -hmm. So we are very, um, again, our review wanted to rebalance a little bit. Uh, even though it seems distant to our publics, we need also to educate our publics as to the importance uh, of what's happening now in Asia. Mm. Jan had a uh, quick comment, and then uh, Walter is... Yeah, well, it's not so quick, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, just to you, uh, I w when I was at the WC, the Changing Character World Program in, in Oxford, there was a, a little luncheon uh, with um, <coughs> the uh, head of the, the, the general, Sir Peter Hall, uh, of the British Army. And he said, uh, he, he wanted to discuss what should we British think about uh, Asia? You know, what should we be ready to deploy to an operation? in Asia, and I thought to myself, wow, that question has not occurred to anybody in Norway <laughs> yet. <laughs> you know, what will we contribute in East Asia, for instance? Uh, uh, but you're of course right, the alliance is an alliance, not just uh, we are the demandeurs on the Americans. The Americans uh, uh, will ask, as they do, uh, for contributions. So that's something that uh, is a bit mind-boggling, as uh, some would say. Uh, and, but another point, not related to this, but to deterrence, it would be nice to have escalation dominance, wouldn't it, in a given theater? Uh, because uh, it would give more, uh, in a way, predictability, security. Um, and when we talk about escalation dominance, uh, it's from a position of uh, normality. I mean, if, if one says we establish a new normal by patrolling more, more in the Barents Sea or whatever, uh, that is when done in relatively peaceful time, not escalation, but establishing a new normal from which one may then uh, act. Mm -hmm. But what my point was about uh, was about uh, this sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty, of course, is an impossible concept to discuss for political scientists because uh, <laughs> it, it's an endless discussion. But well, if we, we say <laughs> that, instead of having an endless discussion, we say that, yes, Security and defense capabilities belong to the nation state, it belongs to states. The UN originally was intended for some to become a su have a supranational force of intervention, never materialized. Even NATO has just some few common assets. Uh, and therefore, I think it's, a very, it's very clear that national interests come first. Uh, and uh, there will be, if you're going to die for something, it has to be for your country, if anything at all. So, I mean, you still hear one, one pleads allegiance to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the king as the highest commander and to the country. 
And uh, in this field, security and defense, this is so close to the heart of sovereignty that this is why you don't let go. You don't have a, a common European air defense, for instance, and I don't think it will happen, however expensive it may get to have more than critical mass for each country. Mm. Cooperation, yes, uh, but <coughs> integration uh, to sort of up to sovereignty, to a critical point in sovereignty, but not beyond that. Mm. Uh, and that may not go for all countries, but for most countries. And I would also say that the Trump's criticism of the lack of spending is of course not new, the 2%. It's a European self-imposed 2%. It's not something uh, imposed on us. In the Cold War, Norway spent 3% uh, under heavy American arm twisting. And I think American arm twisting is unfortunately what it takes to get the spending going also here. But it's not much 2% and we are at 1.6. You Germans are at 1.38, I think. Uh, the French, the British at 2%, uh, not much compared to China and to Russia and to, to America. Walter, uh, and then we need to widen the discussion okay. with uh, the audience as well. Yep. All right, well, uh, I thought I would, you know, we've been talking about how with the return of geopolitical compu uh, competition and real security threats, the, the conversation in Europe and the thinking in Europe is beginning to, to change. And I wanted to just put in a, a word for maybe how much more change is still needed uh, or how early we still are in this process by, by giving an example. Uh, because I think the probably the biggest factor now in the, the security and calm that Europe enjoys is probably fracking in the United States. And why do I mean that? Well, obviously, in the, you know, let's just think. Suppose the price of oil today were at $150 to $200 a barrel, which is more or less where it would be if you take out that production. What happened, you know, how much money does Putin have? Um, how, what does the Italian economy look like? What does the Greek economy look like? What do intra-European politics look like? What does the French economy look like with oil at that price? Um, what resources are available for the dueling parties in the Middle East? How much money would ISIS have had access to while it controlled oil production? Right. So this is fundamental to what stability remains in the West. And yet virtually everyone in Europe loathes and despises fracking, considers indulgence in fracking part of the kind of American blindness that will destroy the planet through climate change. And if it could, would try to, would, would try to stop, would stop it. Um, I am not saying that climate change isn't a problem or that, some, that we don't need to be thinking about what to do. But in fact, the Paris process is a perfect example of, an, of a post-historical dream machine. Um, you know, a sort of a, uh, an, airy, an airy set of overlapping improbabilities that if you squint and feel hopeful, look a little bit like it might maybe somehow provide a basis on which later we might be able to solve the problem. Um, and yet it, uh, and yet I think in, in European opinion, I don't know about elite opinion so much, but certainly public opinion, would sacrifice the reality of oil policies that make European continued union, allow the union to function and keep the balance of power somewhat stable. They would gladly sacrifice this for the illusion of a Paris Accord, illusory path. So the, 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 the return to history is going to involve the dismantling of illusions mm. on a rather large and painful scale. Yeah. Mm. And if 
if the sort of if elites don't dismantle them wisely and with forethought, they will be demolished by demagogues yeah. and political forces acting randomly, but but acting in the service of reality against lies that are no longer sustainable. So we are, you know, the, the process of moving from post-historical dream Europe of the 1990s into the actual Europe facing a very, very difficult global situation of today, we've only begun to make the turn and already we're quite weary and depressed <laughs> by, by what has happened. Uh, and, and, and doing it and preparing the public for it is really going to be uh, a, a challenge. Um, excellent. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a happy thought. <laughs> um, we're opening up for, uh, for the audience. Karsten Fries, uh, if you'd like to uh, post a question. And you can comment on Walter's uh, scenario or and his question. And Ulf, if you'd like a question afterwards, uh, Mike's yours. Thank you. I think I'll stand up for the, for the sake of the other. Sorry. Uh, so my name is Karsten Fritz. I work at, at Nukbi. I, actually, I want to be. Uh, I mean, I don't want to follow up on the large questions here. I want to be more specific. I have a specific question to Claudia and to Etienne, if I may. Um, visiting NATO a few days ago, um, and looking at German rearmament or norm, German normalization or whatever you want to call it. It's still a glass, uh, if, if not even half full, it's still a way to go. And I want to share with you something I learned it just illustrates how, how what's missing. So in a battalion in, in Lithuania that is run by the Germans, Norwegian are participating, the Germans are not in an operation but in an exercise, legally speaking, formally speaking, which means that they work till four o'clock in the afternoon and then they put off the uniform and fire up the barbecue, whatever. Whereas the Norwegian troops and the rest of them are at full combat readiness with sharp ammunition 24-7, with day, day night, right? Uh, and that is, of course, for all political reasons, Germany just be able to go there was a challenge for Germany, but you're still not operational in the same way as your allies, right? So I think that sort of illustrates that, you know, it, it takes a while. We would all like to see Germany become a more or less a normal military European power, but there's certainly a way to go, not to mention, of course, the catching up with submarines and everything else that might so I, I'd just like your comment on that. And, and to at the end, another comment, of course, that we, we see a lot in this, the NATO is the north-south dimension. Like we up here and the Baltic states look only to Russia. We don't care about the south. And opposite in the southern, southern Europe, Italians don't care about Russia. They only look south. I, I, I simplify, of course, exag exaggerate. The point is that uh, when I talk to, to, to you know, our, our Norway and other, other kind of northern European states really want to contribute to the southern flank because you need Italian and, 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 and Spanish and, and, and French and Portuguese support for what we do in the Terence terms, collective defense. But it's very difficult to get the concrete proposals. What shall we do more? What shall NATO do more to fight, you know, to, to strengthen itself on the southern flank? Uh, and especially the Italians are, are not being very, they are talking a lot about it, but they don't come up with any ideas. Maybe you have some ideas what NATO can do more. Thank you. All right, uh, Claudia first and then Etienne. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of the normalization uh, concept or, or, or word because normalization implies that there's some somewhere normal normality standard that country should live up to. Uh, and then I wonder whether Norway, France or the UK or maybe Switzerland is a normal standard, um, which would imply very different roads for Germany. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit uncomfortable with the normalization thing. Um, I think whenever, whenever uh, I talk or whenever there's talk about Germany taking up greater responsibility, one, one should be very honest. Germany, after the Second World War, perfectly learned the lessons the Allies gave Germany. Never again, never alone, mm -hmm. you know, all that history until 1990. That was something like 50 years. And then in 1990, the same Allies said, no, that's fine. You, you learned the lesson, now you can change back. But if you want to change strategic cultures, again, coming back to political science terms, changing strategic culture is a generational task. Unification took place in 1990, now we are in 2017. Um, so I, th I think with all the criticism, and I myself, I'm, I'm very unhappy, unsatisfied with several things Germany did over the last years. I think one should not underestimate how long it takes to change the strategic culture of a country. 
And then I can obviously say, what? They don't go to Mali with the first entry force. Oh my God, what losers? But I could also say, hey, uh, Germany um, was the first to sign up for the VGTF, was an all in FAUs, uh, was the biggest European troop contributor b before the Brits moved into the EFP. So I think the question is, where, where actually do I want to take it? Do I want to encourage the Germans and say, hey, that's a good start, maybe, you know, this, 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 lots of homework to do? Or am I, am I going there and I'm the kind of, kind of slush, that's really, you know. So I totally take the criticism and there are several other points you could, you could add. I mean, the first increase of the defense spending went to a great extent to pensions, or to, not pensions, to, to personnel costs. Um, so there are several points where, where, where I agree with your criticism and I would even add other, other areas. I think the overall question is if the tra trajectory is, is there or not. And that brings me to the point I made earlier, that's the government question in Germany. Etienne? Uh, well, very quickly, I, um, it's not necessarily NATO. Uh, I was referring to countries. Whether it's through NATO, through the EU, etc., is uh, in a sense a technicality. Uh, but the, the importance is that everyone realizes in Europe that the security of Europe uh, uh, plays itself out not just up north, which it does, but also down south. And it does in a big way. And do not think that, again, the jihadi threat has disappeared, and do not think that it's a minor, minor or low-end problem. It might be low-end from a purely military operational point of view. Even though, frankly speaking, uh, as an official, I'm not going to try and count the number of European, European countries that would have been able to take Raqqa by force only a few months ago. But I can tell you would have been using only one hand. Uh, but, but beyond the purely military dimension, uh, uh, again, there are many, many things at play today uh, on the other side of the Met Sea uh, that will affect Europe and will better prepare for that. So it's, uh, 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 it's not just, again, a military answer. It has to be a whole of government, and it has to be done uh, 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 with the perspective that uh, our common security interests are at stake there. It's not just the French or the, the Italians or the Portuguese. Uh, again, if we start thinking like that, then yes, we will end up as separated clusters with completely regionalized security policy. My country doesn't want to do that. We, we, uh, we try and have a global policy as much as possible. I think it's the same for the UK, and it's th that's exactly what is required of the whole of Europe, of all, all European countries. You cannot just think about your local problem. Uh, that, that was what I, what I wanted to uh, communicate, if you want. Carsten and uh, Ulf are going to uh, wrap up the conference, so I wanted to give you a chance to, okay. to, to ask a question. The director of NUPI, Ulf Sverdrup. Uh, yes, thank you so much. I just want to pick up on one of your remarks on the, on the dream, waking up from the dream, uh, recognizing there's a long way to go. And I agree on that. I also agree very much on uh, what you said about uh, fracking, in the f sense that the energy revolution is ongoing in the US is tremendous. It would change the geopolitical outlook, of course, of the US. It will make gas into a global commodity, changing global energy markets. And we can also add that the renewable revolution will also change a lot of the energy situation and, and the former kind of energy producers, among them Norway, might have difficulties with coping with that. Um, but I must say I disagree with you on two things. The first is that I don't see Europeans as being principally against fracking. Uh, I guess if it was possible to do it in Europe, a lot of Europeans would love to do it. Uh, so it's just so not true. It's been banned. It's just not true. It's been banned by law. Yeah, but uh, then it's easy to ban if it's not so easy to do. Right? It was easy to do. It was easy. It was to easy. Do. I worked that. It was very easy to do. Okay. Anyway, and and, and then um, and then the Paris Agreement. I think that in some sense, its climate uh, challenges is a fundamental threat, and uh, the, you might have a poor agreements and bad agreements or good <laughs> agreements. I don't know if the Paris Agreement is. At least we should struggle to find some kind of agreements, I think. And uh, I th uh, as I understand it, because of shale, you can replace coal, and the U.S. will meet the Paris commitments anyhow. Isn't that the thing? Well, the so it, why do you question the Paris agreement? Because it really depends on um, to get the, the poor countries to sign up. There were these guarantees of, 
a fund that begins at 100 billion a year and then grows. The fund is defined in different ways, but but there's there's virtually no prospect that anything like that money will be achieved. And you could never get the U.S. Congress to vote, say, $34 billion a year to be transferred. Uh, so, and interestingly, you know, so that if you think of Paris simply in terms of whether or not you'll adhere to voluntary agreements to decrease your own emissions uh, in rich countries, that's actually rather easy, although, although actually most countries are so far not fulfilling those requirements. But it's the finance, and uh, this is you know this is sort of one kicks this down the, the road, but it it really isn't there, and without it, the poor countries won't do it, uh, won't do all the things that they've committed uh, voluntarily committed, and this has been I think clear for some time, but it's easier for politicians to pretend that there's an agreement and pretend that there's progress. This is, I think, a case of, you know, some of the thinking that has gone into Paris makes a lot of sense. But I would also finally add, just on the on the the uh, climate approach, that if that it's actually an attempt to impose a utopian program in the name of climate change, because one has to denuclearize. Although nuclear power uh, is a very good way of carbon-free energy generation. One also has to do it while stopping large dams like dams in the Mekong and so on that are traditionally how many countries generate large amounts of renewable power. So that it's an attempt to actually shift onto the renew shift the entire energy industry onto some technologies that probably can't bear the weight that's on them. It's a very expensive path. It's a utopian path. It's a post-historical path. If climate change really is such a threat that the whole earth will perish, well, why can't Germany run nuclear power plants for 20 more years? Um, you know, the climate change is serious enough so that we all have to change everything, but not serious enough that we should allow genetically modified soybeans that wouldn't need fertilizer plants or pesticide plants. So, what you, so the climate movement takes a real problem and a real threat, but then seeks to use it to drive a utopian set of policy proposals that can't work. And, uh, and that, I think, is, that to me is an example of uh, unreal politic. Uh, the problem is real, but the, 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 the path doesn't get you there. Um, so, I think we've got, we, we have to, you know, we, again, when a problem is, when, a, when fundamentally you think all problems are solved, you can afford illusions and utopias. But we actually live in a world of ser many serious problems, of which climate is very much one. Um, but actually much less freedom of action in how we solve them. And we have to be much less choosy about the methods that we use because we don't have the luxuries that, that we thought we did just a few years ago. Uh, quick comments from, yeah. uh, I believe you might defend the Paris no, uh, no, Accords I'm, I'm and then a, a Andrew quickly. I'm a defense expert and a defense official. I'm not going to make comments on that. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to point out is that maybe the, uh, the US attitude on this was badly perceived in Europe because it's, it fits into a broader picture of sometimes we feel even though much of the multilateral order as we know it has been actually created and, and supported by the U.S. for so long, but now sometimes from the U.S. there is contestation of yep. that. And the, uh, the, the example I have in mind is not so much uh, the Paris Agreement, of which I, I don't know much, uh, but is uh, the imposition, uh, the international imposition of national sanctions, mm -hmm. including on European companies, and uh, that is an issue. And that is not, that, that, that also weakens the international order. At a, it's not comparable in any way to what we discussed today, mm -hmm. of course. But it, it, it feeds yep. the same kind of, of move of, of that order being questioned from the inside, as you put it, and being attacked from the outside. So yes, we have some, uh, yep. certainly some serious work to do between yep. nationally and between Europeans, but there, is, there might be also some reflection in the US going on about the example, just this yep. one example I took 
of uh, internationally imposed national sanctions. No, I, th I think that's that's a fair point. And again, I think we've got to we've got to understand that in the post-historical era that we are now so sadly exiting from, uh, we all thought of polis international politics as putting the finishing touches on a system that already was basically in place and worked. So we were, you know, we, we had the basic design, we had the basic equipment, everything was more or less organized with just a few improvements and every now and then an adjustment. But in the, in, I think in the world that we are waking up to, uh, there are elements of the design of the multilateral system that have to be looked at again. And how we do it, and it will be more difficult because as conditions grow more turbulent, both domestically in many countries and then in the international space, each government has less freedom of action, has less political freedom of action to compromise on domestic issues to achieve an international result. So that international institutions generally and the international system generally are going to be facing more friction in the future mm -hmm. than in the past. Mm -hmm. And this again I think is part of part of what we have to think about as we look at you know how to say preserve the best of the past as we move on to a future that I think is is really going to be quite challenging. Andrew and then a question from the screen to care. Just very quickly <coughs> I uh, I spent about two years, two and a half years actually, when I was with GMF, looking at the whole shale gas issue as it kind of played itself out in Central Europe, Ukraine, Romania, Poland. Uh, and the thing that struck me the most was that what really killed the projects was a combination. Some of it was bad legislation, some of it was bad rock, but most of, most of that was, was ideology, was, was the, the kind of insistence uh, that pragmatism has to take second place to, to real economic considerations. Case in point, I think Germany will shut down its last nuclear reactor at 2020. I believe that's, that's their plan. Uh, it will have an energy deficit, already has. It needs to buy electricity from 30 humming nuclear reactors in, in France. Uh, natural gas is a gateway to renewables. I mean, every environmentalist will tell you that. Yet the development of shale gas in Central Europe was killed for a variety of reasons, and this is a long story, I can write articles about that. Uh, but at the peak in Poland, there were 114 concessions. All major American oil companies were there, a number of small operations prospectors. Fast forward two or three years, had Central Europe produced shale gas, several staggering things would have happened. One, tremendous increase in supply, those countries would have to produce two, three, four times more than they were actually consuming, otherwise this would not be viable. Two, you would have spot market pricing for energy. For the Russians, that was like snatching their rice bowl away from them. I mean, it, 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 I think Walter's absolutely right that the, the relative ability of, of the Russians to fund their government and their military is directly proportionate to uh, the price of oil and gas. I mean, that's just how this game is played. But we ended up in a situation where we, Germany continues to be supplied to a large extent with Russian gas that travels through leaky pipelines, compressor stations, and all of that. But that's get, that gets a green leaf snapped onto it. Whereas the fact that my country is producing gas and oil is being looked down upon as somehow the return to a Neanderthal era of, of you know, carbons and whatnot. <laughs> My general point is, I think what Europe needs, and in, to, to a large extent America as well, is a return to thinking in pragmatic terms, problem solving, mm. not having these grand ideological visions, virtue signaling about how, you know, how we all should feel about ourselves, polishing our laurels and, and, and whatnot, but actually realizing that we're in a state-on-state -state competition that's kicking up ever faster, it's going to accelerate, I mean, I look at it from the point of view of the U.S. military. If you look at this generation of officers, when I was at the Naval War College, most of the guys I got, lieutenant colonel, colonel rank from the Army in particular, they were soft guys. I mean, they spent their entire careers, for the most part, chasing, you know, jihadis over the mountains and whatnot. They were not thinking in terms of 
large conventional military operations, no control over airspace and whatnot. And I think these are the lessons that every military will have to relearn, and that includes the European militaries. You know, we're at the tail end of an era, I think, when we need to return to a very hard-nosed, pragmatic approach to, to how the alliance will reconstitute itself, but with the principal assumption up front, this is of real value. The fact that the Americans and the Europeans work together in this collective framework is the sine qua non of our mutual security. And then from there we can start talking about who should contribute what to what extent. Last comment on the 2% number, this, this is not an imposed number. This is a number that we as an alliance decided, correct? We all decide, I mean, why two, why not 2.1, why not 8, 1.7, it doesn't matter, but it's a political marker. And if you look at it from the point of view of Red America, this is a political commitment that the allies have made to the alliance, to all of us. So when you're going from Wales to Warsaw and once again, yes, we will once again commit to once again 2% and once again it's five people or whatever who are, five players who are spending this, this creates problems. Not because of the capabilities that should be bought with this, but because of the political dynamic in the alliance. That we're not in the same boat, or at least that the Europeans are looking to the Americans to provide security, and the Europeans will continue to drink latte and kind of look at us. You know, <laughs> and say, you're, right. you're, oh, you're oh, goofy guys. <laughs> Skinny jeans and everything. Well, yeah. no, I, I won't get that far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we'll uh, turn to the screen and uh, return to Russia following an interesting discussion on uh, energy and environmental policy and uh, its implications for the security realm. realm. Uh, Kier, how do we defend against information warfare and <coughs> Russian influencing attempts? That's a question that's been being asked constantly since information warfare suddenly enjoyed this resurgence in popularity and after the early part of 2014. And it's still being asked constantly because unfortunately the answer has remained the same from the very beginning, but nobody is doing it. There is a step to be taken before you consider any way of countering Russian information warfare, and that is simply to assess whether or not it actually works, which nobody is doing. Nobody's measuring the impact and the effect of the different information campaigns that Russia undertakes to see whether they do in fact have a real impact in achieving Russian objectives or whether it is all just fluff and noise and can be safely monitored and therefore ignored. Because with the situation we have at the moment with media hype and with politicians running scared, there is the likelihood that resources, if they do finally become allocated to countering these things, will be pointed at precisely the wrong problems, not the ones that are actually a threat to our, to our way of life and to our society. So step one, do the metrics. Actually conduct the detailed studies for what works in terms of influencing mass consciousness and specifically where Russia achieves its aim of disinformation and false information spilling over from public opinion space into decision-making space. That's the key criterion. When exactly do they achieve the effect of, of changing policy? There is a fabulous case study that people have been talking about for the, for the last 20 minutes. Of course, new energy, be it in the US or in Europe, was an enormous threat to Russian interest, and therefore Russia poured enormous resources into trying to prevent it happen. Happening. Where does this ideological opposition to fracking come from? It comes from Gazprom. It comes from Russia. This has been known for a decade. Who has actually studied how those campaigns worked and how they were so incredibly effective, as you said, in shutting down all of these projects within Europe? The studies simply are not there in the public domain, but they're long, long overdue. Hmm. Very interesting. And Robert, you had a comment. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would uh, echo uh, all, of, all those things. I know Akira's actually got a brilliant track record of having written on this uh, subject. Uh, there's a, a very, it's a lost art, I think, um, being able to understand information warfare. Um, and we need to go back and study a bit of history. Um, there's a very, very good example of uh, sustained information operation campaigns uh, run by Russia between 1863 and 1895 in Central Asia. Um, Britain had to learn how to manage uh, that, that particular sort of way of uh, operating. And they come down to all the principles we already know about. Early warning uh, is one. Uh, we need um, a very good intelligent screen, however that is constituted. In the electronic environment, I would imagine, is where that's going to be. Rapid reaction, clear and robust diplomacy, 
um, counter-offensive in enemy depth. I mean, these are all pretty well understood military kind of concepts, but they all apply to the information domain. And then the ability to either, to, to use some sort of strategic design against them, which would be um, either escalation uh, of mass, or it would be a tilt, you know, adopting whatever the reflexive sort of approach is, your, the propensity of your opponent, and then being able to draw on that and turn that into a weakness. Um, the classic one, which we've been joking about for the last couple of evenings, is the fact that Vladimir Putin is regarded in London amongst gay men as a gay icon. <laughs> Here is the man who parades himself as a great strong man who goes bareback on horses, <laughs> and the expression bareback has a very different meaning amongst <laughs> the gay community in London, I can tell you. Um, uh, but what it means is, I think what the real problem uh, for us in the Western world is rules of engagement. Um, we don't know, not only have we lost the history and lost the art of doing this, not taking it seriously, we just don't know what our rules of engagement should be uh, in this electronic environment and information environment. And until we get that clear, we're going to be constantly reacting and be uh, off balance uh, by any uh, adversary uh, or rival, any adversary, including Iran, actually, for that matter. Hmm. Excellent. And uh, another question. Um, you talked about weaknesses and exposing them and exploiting them. What about NATO's weaknesses? Are NATO weakening fears exaggerated? Despite the US pivot to Asia, uh, the engagement is up. Is NATO stronger today uh, than uh, previously? Anyone? Certainly. The, Certainly. The, Go ahead. The US commitment to, uh, the US commitment <laughs> to Asia has not diminished US uh, commitments fiscally or in terms of, of troops to NATO. I think where NATO is, you know, where, where NATO is, is weak is not so much in troops and cannons and whatnot, but in political cohesion and vision among the members. That, um, and here again, you have problems within the EU, you have transatlantic problems that, you know, what is NATO for, the, this, the post-historical narcosis, um, you know, you ask yourself, suppose a few little green men, like the ones who popped up in, in Ukraine, were to pop up in a couple of Estonian villages and say, no shots have been fired, no true armies have crossed the frontier, but we are now the free Russian Republic of Estonia, of, of Eastern Estonia. Narva. Narva. Narva, Narva, the free Narva. Republic of Narva, <laughs> and we seek reunion with our Russian motherland. Okay, no shots have been fired, uh, yet Estonia's territory, Estonia would say Article 5 and invoke it, but there's no shooting war in Europe. Does Chancellor Merkel or her successor agree to launch a shooting war in Europe where one doesn't exist against Russia? Now that's only one of a number of questions that one might ask, but NATO in the Cold War, it was fairly clear what was and wasn't, uh, you know, what, what was okay and what was not okay. And that fuzziness around where, where the NATO countries are committed to each other, is Turkey a member of NATO? Well, legally speaking, yes, to what extent does it act in solidarity? Hungary is another case in point. The NATO countries are radiating out in different directions politically over time, even as the security environment is getting more challenging and more differentiated. So that doesn't necessarily mean that NATO is weaker, but it means that NATO is different. And we have to, we have to think hard about where the alliance is and what exactly it does and doesn't mean. It was Andrew and then Etienne. Yeah, I just wanted to add at the same time, you know, again, if you look at our deployments on the flank, the uh, special meeting in Brussels results, the talk about two additional uh, headquarters, uh, the kind of gradual grinding, but nonetheless uh, increased uh, commitment of resources. I would argue glasses half full, definitely we're moving in the right direction, so NATO is stronger. It's, it's, it, but I agree completely with Walter's point. This is a political question. 
if you look at the potential of NATO, vis-a-vis -vis the potential of Russia, for example, it's what, one to eight, uh, one to 10? I mean, economic, population resources, uh, all of the above, uh, this is really no contest, shouldn't be any contest. So I'm coming back to my original point. The real issue is getting our internal question right. If we get that set, if we get back on the same sheet of music, on, on what is the uh, common threat assessment, not just declared at another summit in Brussels, but something that really permeates the entire organization from the top down, so the guy at the bottom knows it the same way as the guy at the top. That's the real strength of, 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 the, of the alliance. Um, and I, here, I think the jury is out in terms of how these regional security optics are playing themselves out. What are we willing to, I mean, in the, quest, in the example that Walter you know, gave, it's almost like you're traveling west from the border and everything increasingly changes. You know, The French would probably say, well, but I mean, the real threats are coming from the Med. This is where this stuff is pouring into Europe. Uh, the Spaniards might even say, where's Estonia? I'm just joking. You know, but but <laughs> that is the real issue, how to bring everybody around the same threat assessment and be able to act in solidarity. I think that's key. It's a political question. At the end. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thanks. You know. Chance has it that I can respond directly. Uh, <laughs> I think I made it quite clear uh, uh, that we regard that as serious as uh, what's coming from the South, and we are with the Brits in Estonia. So the quick answer is that if something like that were to happen, which it will not, the Estonian police first would shoot. Now, if there are other mm. elements coming from the other side of the border that would shoot back, then it would be a different situation. And then we get back to what, was, uh, what, what I was referring. Do you really want to shoot back and kill a significant number of, of British and French troops? And where does that land you? Now, for us, uh, that is quite deter deterring. Uh, because for us, it's not about escalation dominance. We never bought that. Uh, it's the risk of escalation that's in itself is deterring. Uh, and I fully concur with, with what Kier uh, 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 said this morning. Uh, uh, in a way, we have taken care of that specific issue. And, um, mm -hmm. it, could, it can be improved. On, I won't have a technical discussion here. But by and large, it's a huge move, as you pointed out yourself, that, that we did, that we are doing what we're doing now with EFP. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's a, for us a very credible answer. Uh, final point, uh, during the Cold War, there were also many scenarios, limited scenarios within NATO as to what the Soviets could have done, seizing just, uh, you know, parts of Denmark, using a big uh, paratroop uh, operation, Descenti, that kind of stuff. Though it's, 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 it was not as clear cut as we make it in retrospect. We also, we also had back then uh, sort of gray scenarios in Yugoslavia also, NATO looked at that, looked in into Soviet, it. Yeah. Uh, and Yugoslavia was not of course, part of NATO, but yet we had to take that into account because yeah. Italy was next door, etc. So, um, but I, I just want to conclude by saying that this is not a return to the Cold War. If, well, as far as historical analogies go, probably it's more like 19th century. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to run the risk of, of son sounding like your typical Southern European guy, but uh, as we say with Russia, it has to be fairness and dialogue because we do have some common interests. Uh, um, some were mentioned by Kier, long term. Uh, others are in the way we manage uh, the jihadi threat, where here obviously we have an objective. Uh, whatever our differences over Syria, we do have an objective interest in common. Uh, so firmness and dialogue. But this is not the Cold War all over <coughs> again. Uh, and uh, again, th th there are other threats that need to be taken care of. Uh, it's not just about uh, uh, what we've been so much discussing. Jana has a comment, and I'm eager to tack on the next question as well about whether Nordic-German defense cooperation can mend part of the weakening of the Western alliance. But first, your uh, yeah. comment to... Yep. Time is running out, or time is running fast, as Ronald <laughs> Reagan said when he was <coughs> president. Uh, and he said uh, he had great fun. Uh, when he was doing that. No, my comment is simply that um, uh, Article 5 is too important to experiment too much with. And the only time we have invoked it was after a terrorist attack. So uh, the Article 5 makes for a necessity of cooperation in NATO, although many will be free riding on it. Uh, Article 5 
uh, it's in the interest of all to preserve it. Uh, but that means, uh, doesn't mean that day-to-day -day policy making in security and defense won't be taken care of by interested groups of states that share interests and so on. Uh, and uh, a final point, strategically it is also sometimes very useful to be unclear about things. If you're un in intentionally unclear, uh, that can be a great advantage. If you are just confused, that's not so. Hmm. Yeah, a comment from Robert. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, collect a couple of thoughts, really, that, that have gone on. We were asking about the question was about NATO and its capability, and, and I absolutely agree with the other speakers that um, in terms of equipment and budget, we're on track. Um, but the one about decisions, a really key one. Um, two, two contrasting examples. Um, the paradox of Brexit is that Britain seems to be now more and more committed to NATO uh, and Europe because it knows what it's probably about to lose, which I think is very interesting. And yet there's a Dutch colonel at the NATO Defence College um, who we were talking about Article 5 and, you know, the question was posed to me, would I ever, if I was Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, I mean, God help us if I am, um, <laughs> you know, uh, would I press the button? And I said, well, if you were the Prime Minister of the Netherlands and you were given that nuclear option, would you do it? And he said, absolutely no, under no circumstances. And there was a sort of hushed silence. As I, and as an academic, I said, I would definitely do it. You know, I mean, that's the point, you know, that that's what it's about. So commit the willingness to do these things. And there was an American officer with me, and um, he said, hell, son, what country are you from? <laughs> and the um, <coughs> Dutch, Dutch guy said, um, I'm from Holland. And um, <laughs> the American said, hey, well, you don't matter anyway. Um, <laughs> which I thought was indicative of, of what, where we've gone wrong with decision making, you know, um, in, in NATO. But it seems to me that um, we, uh, you know, Britain is, is trying to encourage other NATO countries in Europe to have a common operating concept in line with the United States. I think it's been successful in helping to connect together, you know, European ideas of, you know, what their defence problems are and how we should operate together. The centres of excellence around NATO are doing a tremendous job at generating the debate and sharing the information effectively. We still have problems in information sharing uh, and intelligence sharing, but we are we're on the way. Now, here's a question I, I, would, I would pose back to, to you, the audience, though, to think about, is that, you know, uh, uh, my good colleague, Otien, says, you know, we, we're not in a, another Cold War. Uh, what if we are? and we don't really just recognize it. What, what would happen if we were to declare, like Winston Churchill, another Iron Curtain speech and say, actually, we are in one? And I'll tell you why. From a British perspective, we are in one. We have attempted Russian overflights of UK airspace. We have Russian ships trying to get into uh, British waters. We have Russian submarines in our allies' waters. We've had the murder of a, um, a, a person on British soil with polonium 210, a, a radioactive poison that could kill hundreds of people. Uh, we have uh, regular, um, uh, you know, interference from Russia in British political life. I mean, how much more serious does it have to get before we recognise um, the situation we're in? And if we were to declare this as now a genuine open confrontation and it's open season, does that change the strategic environment? Does it change the strategic culture? Does it actually help us to recognise what we really pragmatically face? Rather than doing what we're doing at the moment, which I love that expression, post-historical situation. I mean, we are pretending there isn't a problem because actually we're afraid. We're afraid of the consequences of facing up to reality. And I wonder where we just need to get real finally and say enough is enough. I mean, what more will it take for us to take it seriously, I wonder? A wonderful press prospect to take with us into the holiday season, Robert. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, no Christmas presents for you, buddy. <laughs> we have uh, come through to the uh, very end of the panel discussion. It has had uh, uh, a lot of ranging subjects. I did not suspect uh, the homoerotic status of Putin in certain <laughs> sections of Soho to be part of our discussion. But it was. Thank you again, Robert. Uh, what uh, now uh, is left is to think about the big, huge questions posed. Are we behind something or are we in front of something? A pre-war period, I think that's a very interesting concept that we've uh, taken here. And uh, we'll have a quick cup of coffee for 10 minutes and we'll have a summing up of the conference uh, uh, following that. L big hand to the panel. Thank you very much.
we've reached the final uh, wrapping up of uh, what I have, what per I personally found a riveting day of uh, discussions and great presentations. And one more, one more uh, to come is from Karsten Fries of Nupin. Uh, he heads the uh, research group on uh, security and defense there, and uh, will pr uh, provide some uh, closing perspectives on uh, on the conference uh, before we hand the floor to uh, Nupin director Ulf Svadrup uh, at the very end. Please, Karsten. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm glad to see that still someone here. Uh, it's highly appreciated, of course, and I understand also how to, to leave not given like the weather conditions. Uh, I, I called my, my kind of remarks like once upon a time there was a West, but I had to add a question mark uh, to kind of, you know, uh, but, but that's like, that, that's like my, my starting point here. Uh, and, and we discussed this today several times, I'll be very brief on that, but of course the West is often described as liberal, the liberal order, right, an order based on secular institutions, international institutions, uh, democracy, uh, liberal economic principles, uh, rule of law, and all the things. And of course, they have international institutions, some international humanitarian law, uh, European Declaration of Human Rights, and health care principles, etc., etc. That's the international order that, that we, we kind of like. And of course, again, we heard today, and many have said it before, many observers observe, observe <laughs> that, that these, these kind of the Western, the Western moments, the Western dominance in the world is somewhat re being reduced and both and uh, threatened both from within and from outside. From outside, of course, is particularly the rise of Asia and China. So the relative power and influence of Europe and the West is, is de decreasing. And not only are they rising, they're also questioning some of the human rights, basic principle, liberal principles that, that, that we kind of have, have been um, championing. And then, of course, Russia being uh, addressed today a lot, and not only kind of uh, openly resisting many of the principles that we, that we champion and are uh, kind of suggesting alternative international order, um, where strongest, strongest states basically can bully their small states. I put it a bit you know, bluntly here, but that's what it is about. Uh, they can force the neighbors to, to decide if they should join NATO or not, and, or EU or not. And, and as you know, small states like us, we like to choose not to be a member of EU or become a member of NATO as we choose ourselves. And as I see, that's a nutshell, that's the whole conflict with Russia is all about. I mean, that, that very principle. We want to have a system we can choose that ourselves. Now, the West is also under pressure from inside. Um, we also heard about that uh, today. Uh, you know, there are certain challenging to the liberal values, that being uh, minority rights, multi uh, minority rights, multiculturalism, uh, LGBT right, uh, values, uh, rights, and stuff like that. Um, and and of course, uh, but but the point is that the point is that. The core liberal principle is that we allow these debates to take place. And we just don't try to, to kind of crush them down, but we allow them to take place and, 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 and evolve in our societies. Um, it's the institutions that we have that kind of protect these struggles that we need to protect, not necessarily the political values themselves, because they evolve over time. Um, There's a risk these days that we kind of forget about, about all this and like, let's allow the political difference to undermine these institutions. And if this continues, uh, I don't think we'll have meaningful conception of the West in the future. Um, now, many, many observers kind of confuse this analysis of, of kind of the weakening of the West with some kind of a fait accompli that it has to be like this, that it has to continue like this. And I think Rob mentioned that we should avoid the defeatism that we should avoid being like, <laughs> you know, victims of our own analysis. You know, we don't have to accept it even if we see it, right? It's not like the whole world needs to become a cruel world of realist, real, real politics and we can't fight for liberal values anymore. It's just a bit diff more difficult than it used to be. Um, now, to moving to NATO. Uh, these are cru crucial issues because, I mean, arti article to, uh, commitment to Article 5 is, of course, worthless if you don't agree on what the, what the world looks like and what the threats are and how to deal with them. Um, yes, an old-fashioned invasion of tanks across this, the, the borders will be, you know, everybody would recognize this Article 5, but that's not the kind of a threat we're talking about, is it? At least not so much anymore. Um, we talk about uh, pol bilateral political conflicts, cannonball diplomacy, we talk about, about pressure and bullying and cyber attacks, propaganda. 
uh, influence under the threshold attacks of all sorts, uh, uh, little green men, as, as also Walter, uh, Walter pointed out. Um, if you fail to see that, if you end up different perceptions of what this is, well, it doesn't matter how many tanks and how many articles we have uh, if we can't agree on, on using them. And it's a bit bizarre, if I must say, because if you look at NATO, and I just visited NATO earlier this week, and lots of things happening. I mean, since 2014, it's rather impressive what NATO has done, from the Readiness Action Plan uh, to the NATO Response Force to the, now the review of the NATO command structure, making it more uh, relevant. Uh, the Graduate Response Plans being basically our defense plans for Europe are now being uh, dusted off the shelves and, and, and reinvented. Uh, even major joint op operations are being, are being planned now. And they're building new headquarters, both for logistics and also for Atlantic uh, maritime domain. So, I mean, there's a lot of things happening, and the more exercise and training as well. Not the good news, so to speak. And then at the same time, is this, at least currently, right now, kind of absence of US leadership in NATO. It's visible in the North Atlantic Council, it's visible in the, in the, in the, in the military committee, and, and the kind of absence of US allows all the rest of us to start playing our agendas all the time. Uh, and, and that, of course, is not very, very helpful. Um, and in particular, of course, the, the, the kind of silence from the US when it comes to Russia, it's difficult because there, this, there is a kind of a vague political stance when it comes to the US, what, what the, the real political pos position on Russia is. I will not mention Turkey, I just mentioned Turkey. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the, the, the whole tension between North and South, what is most important, as we have discussed today as well. So, so NATO struggles with finding its role in the South. What shall be, uh, what can a military alliance do? So we are we are facing the summit coming up in May. That's a new thing, and uh, the new the new next thing that that the bureaucrats in, in Brussels are looking towards, or the diplomats. And of course, they say that as long as it's not as disastrous as the last one in May, uh, it will be a success, right? So as, as long as Putin doesn't say something, it's Putin. <laughs> Trump says something, uh, you know, uh, shocking, it will be a success. Um, so, in, in, in a nutshell, it's all about keeping the US in, as it always has been. And that's what you need to, be, you need to achieve between now and next July. And, but nonetheless, I mean, even if you all kind of sigh in relief after, after Trump's speech in, 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 in July, the underlying tensions will remain, right? Um, even if, even if the, the, what they call the axis, the axis of adults, they call them now, the, 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 the Tillerson, the, the McMaster, and, and, and uh, Mattis, uh, make sure that you know, Trump's speech will be as he wants it, but we're not sure. We don't know till we will see it. Well, even if that happens, we don't know. We will still have challenges with a more introvert and maybe Asia-focused United States. To keep them in will be challenging. Uh, the north-south dimensions in, in, in NATO continues. Sorry. And our eternal tensions will continue as well. I, I'm tempted to say we need strong leaders in Europe, <laughs> but I mean, that's not a very liberal democratic thing to say, is it? Um, I guess it's better to say that we need political initi initiatives that kind of take us through these things, uh, to kind of revitalize the core principles that, that, that the West is based upon. And as Andrew said, we need pragmatism, uh, problem solving in, 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 in the West. Um, we need a politically firm and, and, and a strong, steady Germany. We need a visionary and pragmatic France. Uh, and of course, the UK that's re ready and willing to stand up for its things. Uh, at this very moment, I think we only had one of the three. So I guess we can say wish Macron all the best. <laughs> and hopefully he will have some, someone else to play with in the next months to come. Uh, but that's where I will conclude. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you so much to all of you for, for being here. Um, last year, we had the, the military powers seminar the, the morning after the election of Donald Trump. And I was asked to kind of make an introductory remark. And I made that kind of, I don't know if it was a mistake, but I said, that because that was the day in November, the same day as in 1989, when uh, uh, you had the changes in Germany and you had the changes in the US election in, in 2016. And I basically compared the two things. 
And I'd just like to take you through, through what has happened since the election of Trump. It's been a really remarkable year, I think, 2017. And let's, let me just illustrate through six small quotes. The first target just a few days before Trump was inaugurated, because at that time, Xi Jinping gave a speech at the Davos meeting where he said, we should recede from our respective national positions and embark on the right pathway towards economic globalization at the right place, at the right pace. And this fall, they had their uh, party congress and basically argued that China should take center stage at the international system. So that's one very significant uh, thing happened. And then just a few days later, in January, 20th of January, Donald Trump at the inauguration speech, his carnage, American carnage speech, said that from this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this way forward, it's going to be only America first. He didn't say America first, he said only America first. Uh, Professor Mead was not so worried about it. Uh, I think uh, some of the others of us are a bit more worried. And then in March 2017, Theresa May wrote a letter basically saying that I hereby notify the European <laughs> Council in accordance with Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union uh, of the United Kingdom's intention to withdraw from the European Union. I think it's a very significant letter she sent the 29th of March. And uh, in a beer, play, a beer tent in Germany, Angela Merkel in May said, uh, "Wir Europäer müssen unser Schicksal wirklich in unsere eigenen Hand nehmen." Basically saying that Europeans have to step up their game and take control of their own destiny. And then uh, to our French partner, Macron basically crushed the European political party system and came out and said all parties can no longer have a mo monopoly in Europe. And then later on he labeled his project basically a Europe that protects. Uh, I think it's also very significant and not so uh, radical, but uh, just a few weeks ago in Russia, Putin at the Valdai Club said that our most serious mistake in relations with the West is that we trusted you too much. And I think through these five, six quotes, we basically have a lot of the picture of what has happened during this year. I would like to, th and I think that during this uh, conference, we have been dealing with some of these uh, statements and reflecting upon the development. I'm not going to run through the conference as such, but I think that Minister Bakke Jensen, he kicked us off nicely, giving an overview of, of uh, the perspectives from Norway and, and, the, and the actions and steps made here in Norway, and then Professor Mead uh, gave us a very nice and very instructive, I think, overview of US politics as it looks from a Trumpian perspective somehow. Uh, he gave us also very good advice, listen to the red states, try to understand, and he viewed the Trump team more as a demolition team rather than a construction team. I think it's... Uh, uh, worthwhile. And then Kier Giles uh, gave a very, uh, I think, in, uh, insightful uh, view of Russian uh, capacities, intentions, developing, uh, arguing uh, along the lines of military capacity building, resilience of the society and the system, but also the challenges on information of war. And I think uh, both for the short term and, and long term, I think that was very valuable contribution. So thank you so much for that. And then we had an uh, excellent discussion, I think, uh, well, our presentation on, on country-specific contributions from Claudia Mayor, uh, basically saying that uh, the developments in Europe and also Brexit and the uh, developments of the illiberal states and uh, a illiberal, illiberal turn in the eastern and central part of Europe is a really fundamental challenge to German foreign policy outlook and about European stability, but how Euro Germans are really trying gradually to get around and to cope with these challenges. So that was an excellent contribution. And then at the end, so, uh, supplemented this, partly stressing the German-Franco alliance, but also the 360 degree outlook of the French politics. So that was uh, useful. Robert Johnson, he's not here now, but he basically tried to comfort us arguing that Brexit, well, Brexit is just politics. 
in terms of security, we will always be there. Well, mm, uh, I just wonder if, if we are all comforted by that. Uh, it might be that politics might make security a bit more difficult. Let's hope he's right. Um, and then Andrew Mishra basically questions, asked a very difficult question, are Europeans ready for war? And I think he would say no to that, or he said no. Uh, and we have to step over the game to be ready and capable, uh, and along with Yonne, uh, stress the need for capabilities and the strategic culture. So I would just like to thank all of you. It's been very rewarding. You have been very pointed. You've been clear. You've been uh, provocative and challenging. And you have been addressing, I think, the key issues uh, over time. And all of this has been led by an excellent moderator, Anders Rumarheim, who had contributed to bring uh, light and uh, uh, enlightenment to the discussion. Let me also um, uh, thank uh, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Louise Dedekan and her team for the cooperation. It's been a really ro a joyful exercise to again organize this uh, event together with you. Uh, no such event happens without uh, the commitment and effort from a lot of people. So I would like in particular to thank uh, Paula sitting over there, Thomas Lensvik, uh, Armin Rundesgård, Vega Walter Hansen and Karsten Fries, who's been organizing this and put together this great panel. And of course, the other NUPI team and others who have been uh, tweeting and other things to make this uh, go around. And of course, I'd like to thank the patient audience who been sitting in here. Hopefully, you had a rewarding day, and it's much better, after all, to sit inside than to be outside in a rather messy weather. So I'd just like to thank you all and uh, welcome you all back to the next year for the 20th anniversary. And I guess we will have more topics to cover. Uh, we, will have, we, have, we have not sorted out all issues. There will be more to be discussed and so uh, until next year. So thank you so much.